सो एवरी वन आई एम प्रदनी प्री फाइनल ईयर अंडर ग्रैड स्टडिंग इंजीनियरिंग फिजिक्स एट आई टी रुड़की एंड टूडे आई बी गिविंग अ प्रेजेंटेशन ऑन द टॉपिक डेवलपमेंट ऑफ एन ऑटोनोमस कॉड रोटर और ड्रोन एज इट्स कॉलोकली नोन एज अ पार्ट ऑफ द कोर्स वर्क फॉर पी एच एन थ्री वन नाइन टेक्निकल कम्युनिकेशन कोर्स रिपोर्ट फोकसिंग ऑन द मॉडलिंग स्टेट एस्टिमेशन कंट्रोल एंड हार्डवेयर एस्पेक्ट्स वॉज मेड अंडर द गाइडेंस एंड सुपरविजन ऑफ प्रोफेसर मयंक गोस्वामी एंड मिस्टर अंकुर कुमार फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फिजिक्स आई टी रुड़की सो थ्रू द कोर्स ऑफ दिस प्रेजेंटेशन आई विल बी गिविंग एन ओवर व्यू ऑफ कॉड रोटर्स अलॉन्ग विद अ डिस्कशन ऑफ द फ्लाइट डायनेमिक्स स्टेट एस्टिमेशन एंड द कंट्रोलर डिजाइन देन आई क्विकली शो अ सिमिलेंट मॉडल ऑफ अ ड्रोन दैट आई डेव developed using aerospace uh, block set toolbox then i'll discuss the hardware architecture of the most uh, common flight controllers that are used and uh, in the end i'll provide a brief uh, case study of the uh, nano core rotors uh, before summarizing all the things so this presentation is supposed to provide an intuitive uh, meaning to all the concepts that i tried to compile and summarize uh, in the report so without any further ado let's get started uh, so quadcopters or drones or uavs that is unmanned aerial vehicles are extremely popular in today's world with the integration of sophisticated control systems these machines are able to function in a robust manner requiring little or almost no human intervention and this is exactly what we refer to as automation being able to perform uh, the work with little or almost negligible external resistance so with a goal to understand how these uavs are able to perform autonomously let's try to define the control problem and our goal out here is to try to understand how the different processes are paired together at a system level and what are the main factors affecting the performance of the system so a typical quad rotor or a quadcopter looks like this it has four rotors which propel using the onboard motor the vehicle can either have a plus or a cross configuration it's essentially just a way of deciding the convention system used while modeling the system behavior now these four rotors spin in a particular configuration two opposite rotors in the air frame that is uh, the uh, base frame uh, have the same but uh, opposite uh, direction spin as compared to the remaining pair and this configuration is essential to move the drone along three rotational axes independently so for a drone if we assume these are the three coordinate uh, uh, axes centered around the center of mass of the drone's body then uh, roll defines uh, the uh, rotation about the x axis which is defined along the y axis and the yaw is defined about the z axis and the vehicle is also free to move about in 3d space so essentially it has 6 degrees of freedom but uh, only four input variable that is total thrust and the moments along each axis so the overall uh, control system in this case is under actuated because we have uh, to use four uh, inputs to control 12 output variables which are represented in the earth's frame but we can also consider a model uh, like this uh, where a is an inertial frame b denotes the body fixed frame of the drone so to get from a to b frame which could be aligned in any rotation in 3d uh, rotation matrix is often used uh, which has the following uh, matrix form so before we move on uh, to studying the control stuff let's quickly go through the propulsion process in uavs so we have motors which generate the thrust this rotates the propellers or the rotors which pushes air down causing a reactionary lift now suppose our drones air frame only had one axis instead of two then if we position the motor such that thrust is only generated at the center of mass of the axis then the vehicle will just move upward if we place the motor at a slight uh, distance then there will be a resultant moment about the center of mass causing both rotation as well as translation and to only rotate the axis we can just place two motors at the end of the uh, frame like it's shown here and we can then have a same spin so this will cause the drone to rotate along a 2d plane and suppose we wanted to stop this rotation we could just rotate the spin of one motor such that the neck torque is zero but there's still a resultant thrust which if it is equal to mg then it will make our uav hover at a fixed altitude or at least it's supposed to remain fixed 
Introduction of another axis having two more rotors could enable our drone to perform the same in three dimensions. So now we have four motors of which two have say a clockwise and two have an anti-clockwise spin. A drone could uh, also have a formation where the opposite motors are not spinning in the same orientation. However, the drawback with this is that we won't be able to introduce yaw into uh, this particular system. So in uh, the uh, uh, configuration where the opposite motors don't have same spin, this change would create an imbalance of forces which can easily be given by right hand rule and the drone will pitch or roll depending on the net time. So here the yaw doesn't uh, change the pitch and the roll. Uh, so this is the ideal case, the ideal configuration. However, uh, uh, the in the case of the other configuration uh, the yaw also uh, affects the pitch and the roll angle and by figuring out how the uh, spin causes net torque to propel our drone we can develop such a motor mixing algorithm so we know we can command the thrust by setting all four motors to the same speed then we can create a yaw by increasing two motors spinning in the same direction and decrease the other two pitch is created by increasing or decreasing the front motor pair and then commanding the back pair in the opposite direction and the roll is uh, just the same but with the left right pair. So this is a simple uh, motor mixing algorithm that is uh, used in the drones controller. Now the first main objective of our controller to tackle under actuation is full field. But before we continue discussing about the control in further detail, I'll briefly summarize the underlying equations of motion that govern the flight dynamics since the discussion so far only talked about the attitude angles without understanding how they are dependent on the drone's physical parameters. So following equations, some of the flight dynamics of uh, drones and have been derived from first principles. The momentum theory gives the expression for thrust and reaction torques generated at each rotor which are used to calculate the moment about each axis. So I have written a, a MATLAB code uh, to simulate a drone based on these equations. So as we can see by feeding in the equations for inertia, uh, the rotation matrix, net thrust and simplified expressions for tau phi, theta and psi which are the three moments, we can calculate uh, the Jacobian using the Euler-Lagrange method and by defining the physical parameters such as mass which in this case is taken to be 0.5 kg and inertial values which I took from the net and defining this omega term uh, which uh, relates to the motor speed as inverse square root I simulated a drone model using internal plot function so if uh, the omega is zero then the drone will uh, just fall back to the ground because uh, we aren't propelling the rotors and uh, after a bit of testing I figured out that if I keep omega equals 1.1 then the uh, uh, drone tries to stabilize itself at a fixed altitude after s getting spawned at the origin 0, 0, location. Now uh, in this case I didn't consider the aerodynamic uh, effects but uh, later on I will demonstrate how we can use simulating for the same. One most important aerodynamic effect that adversely affects the drone's performance is rotor flapping. So consider the following diagram which uh, depicts the placement of one of the rotors when the drone is in translational motion. Now in translational flight, the advancing blade of a rotor sees a higher effective velocity relative to the air, which while the uh, retreating blade sees a lower effective velocity. So this results in a difference in lift between uh, the two rotors causing the rotor blades to flap up and down once per revolution. So this flapping of the blades tilts the rotor plane back away from the direction of motion and this is the reason why we often see drones getting displaced from their equilibrium position despite the absence of adverse external factors such as wind etc. And this effect is quite significant in small sized UAVs such as micro and nano quads and often uh, demands a development of a robust control system. Now often uh, robots both uh, autonomous and manually controlled use some common low level sensors such as gyroscope, accelerometer, magnetometer which are found in IMUs or inertial measurement units. 
these sensors help sense the angular rate acceleration of the body frame relative to the inertial frame and are used to predict the state of the robot such as position velocity etc now the detailed maths behind this is included in the report but here i want to explain the need of state estimators in the control problem so the sensors on board the drone cannot directly measure the state of the drone because the readings that these sensors provide are signals that represent the parameters such as angular rates of the point where they are placed on the drone relative to the inertial frame and we have to use uh, some mathematical model of our drone governed by the flight dynamics to find an estimate of the drone's state variables that is all uh, the values relative to the center of mass of the drone so consider this analogy say we want to track the location of a car the onboard imu and odometers measure the relative position of the car so for an absolute measurement we often use gps the imu data is updated quite frequently compared to the gps however the imu data is prone to drift whereas the gps data is noisy since the signals are transmitted across long distances so figuring out the position of the car using these sensors is tricky state estimation is the process of finding out the optimal position of the vehicle by combining data from all these sensors which is more likely to give a better estimate of the parameter we are looking for in this case it's the position of the car so several times a probabilistic based methods are used for estimations kalman filtering is one such technique and uh, i'll try to explain uh, the algorithm for implementing a kalman filter uh so consider a following uh, model where this is the actual plant which gives output y based on uh, these sets of equations and x is the value we want to figure out but we cannot di uh, directly uh, obtain the value from the plant so we first try to model the behavior of the system and then fuse the outputs from uh, both of these which is then sent as an input to the lower block x hat is the estimate of the same variable so our goal is to minimize the difference between x and x hat so we do that by using a controller k which helps us uh, achieve uh, the result faster depending upon the value of the game k so this entire block is called as uh, the state observer which is specially constructed to get an estimate of the variable whose value we wish to know but we cannot directly measure so kalman filter is a type of optimal state estimator which also takes into consideration the noise factor and is hence often used in robotic control systems to fuse the data from sensors like uh, gyro or accelerometer which are extremely prone to noise so i will use the driving car analogy to explain the concept of kalman filters suppose we are building a self driving car which uses uh, only gps for absolute position and we have a fixed waypoint where we want the car to stop so relying only on gps readings will provide different results every time and won't be accurate so we'll study how to implement a kalman filter algorithm in this case so this block diagram represents the dynamics of the car if the input is the velocity uk and the output is the position in this case both uh, yk and xk essentially represent uh, position the same quantity so c is equal to y uh, gps readings are noisy and vk is a random variable uh, that is used to represent this uh, random measurement noise similarly other factors such as uh, atmospheric factors or uh, even the mechanical components introduce measurement noise which is represented by wk now although these random variables don't follow a particular pattern using probability theory we can tell something about their average properties v for example is assumed to be a gaussian distribution with zero mean and covariance r similarly the process noise is defined with a gaussian distribution of covariance q now knowing the car's mathematical model and passing the input through it we can estimate x but again it will be inherently noisy due to the presence of this factor wk so kalman filter can be used here which can fuse this x hat and the output y of k so at an initial uh, time step of k minus 1 the actual car position can be uh, anywhere around the estimate x at k minus 1 and this uncertainty is described by uh, this probability density function so this plot also tells us that the car is most likely going to be around the mean of this distribution now at the next time step 
the uncertainty in the estimate has increased which is shown with this plot which has a larger variance this is because between time step k minus 1 and k the car might have possibly uh, slipped a little bit or might have faced some ob ob obstruction therefore it may have traveled a different distance than what we have predicted by the model and as we discussed before another source of information of the car's position comes from the measurement so here the variance represents in the uh, uncertainty in the noisy measurement now again the true position can be anywhere around the mean a kalman filter multiplies these two gaussian distributions the one in uh, blue and the one in orange uh, resulting in a function with a smaller covariance and taking the mean gives us the optimal estimate of the car's position so this is the expression for a discrete kalman filter which is actually quite similar to the state estimator equation so kalman filter are used for stochastic systems with inherent random noise it is a two step process where a prior estimate is calculated before the current measurement is taken and uh, it takes in the measurement and incorporates it into the uh, prediction to update the prior estimate so this has been summarized in uh, this algorithmic diagram one uh, final point that i would like to state is that the kalman filter is used only for linear systems and is a specific example of the bayesian filter algorithm applied to linear gaussian state space models that i have tried to summarize in this slide for nonlinear systems other types of kalman filters such as uncentered uh, or extended and particle filters are often used so the basic idea is that we don't just directly take in the sensor measurement rather we perform some computations on it to get an optimal estimate and then this is fed into the controller that we will uh, now study so to design a proper controller to maintain a drone's state variables pid is often used p stands for proportional i for integral and d for derivative and can be understood from the following analogy so consider a closed loop uh, feedback system where the input to the plant uh, which is a drone in our case is the propeller speed and the output is the altitude and we want to maintain a constant altitude of say 50 meters and the desired propeller speed to hover at that altitude is say 100 rpm so 50 is the set point and assuming the drone was at uh, ground level initially the error between the set point and the plant output is 50 initially and this is the parameter the, or the error we want to minimize so we create a feedback path that inputs this error into the controller and depending upon the coefficients or the gains it tries to get the system near the desired set point initially suppose we are only using a proportional controller whose output is directly proportional to the present error so a large initial error would result in a higher initial propeller speed and the drone will uh, continue to uh, lift upwards so the, then once it reaches the desired altitude of 50 uh, the error becomes zero and the drone will try to fall down now this will again increase the error term and the drone will keep oscillating with a uh, shrinking amplitude but it will never become steady at a height of 50 that is the system will always have a steady state error now suppose we add a uh, component which keeps track of the previous values and sums it over time so suppose the drone achieves a uh, 100 rpm value at a height less than 50 meters say at 40 meters depending upon the value of kp so after this point the proportional part will stop working but the error is still non-zero and integrating a non-zero quantity will result in an increase in the output so the drone will continue to ascend further this is the role of an integral controller and it helps to reduce the steady state error however there's a chance that the integrator may have summed to a value over 100 rpm so this would cause the drone to keep rising which is what we want since we are below 50 meters however to remove the excess propeller speed the drone will have to go uh, to a higher altitude than 50 meters uh, to create a negative error and this negative error when summed lowers the output of uh, the integrator and slows the propellers down so this overshooting of the goal is usually not desired so again to tackle this problem we can add a component which can predict the future and respond to how fast we are closing in on our goal 
and we do that with a derivative so a derivative produces a measure of the rate of change of the error that is how fast the error is growing or shrinking for example if the drone is rising quickly and fast approaching the goal that means error is quickly decreasing and this component will then have a negative value which when added to our controller will try to lower the propeller speed now the performance of this uh, PID control that uh, that is the following uh, block diagram can be further improved by making modifications in the integrator and derivative. For instance, integrator often uses clamping, which shuts off the integral controller once the motor reaches saturation. So, say the max capacity of our motor is to spin at 100 rpm, and that speed is reached below the set waypoint, like it did in our previous example. So, ideally, our controller will keep increasing the output. However, the same won't be implemented by our drone's hardware. So the integrator will think that the drone is running at say 150 rpm, whereas in reality, the motor is still running at 100 rpm saturation level. So to avoid this miscommunication, clamping is often used. Noise is another factor uh, which is considered in UAV's control system. So if we consider a sensor reading like a gyro, for example, which gives the rate of change of rotation over time. So depending on the DPS, that is degree per second value of our gyro, it is possible to attain a sensor signal which has amplitude as low as 200 to as high as 2000. So quite often sensor signals are high amplitude but low frequency signals, whereas the noise is often a low amplitude high frequency signal. So this figure here represents uh, these two signals, the signal of the reading and the noise. Now this low amplitude noise might not uh, affect our base signal in other types of systems such as a communication system because interference with a small amplitude signal might not have much effect. However, it adversely affects a drone's control system which uses PID control and this is due to the derivative path because uh, the derivative path for uh, 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 low frequency uh, noise signal will often result in a, a steeper slope value and that can uh, be reflected in the final output of the PID controller. Quite often we represent signals as a summation of individual sine functions. This is basically the Fourier transform. So sine function with amplitude omega a will have a derivative with a much higher amplitude in case of uh, low frequency signal because it is multiplied uh, with omega a. and uh, implementing a low pass filter that blocks the frequencies above a certain cutoff value from entering our derivative controller often helps to tackle this uh, issue. But the problem is we have to be a bit uh, more careful while uh, implementing this filter because uh, if we see the previous plot, this particular plot, filtering this uh, section of this signal is not necessary since the noise here has low amplitude. And often implementing filters, especially the non-linear ones, uh, is computationally expensive. So to decide this cutoff frequency in an efficient way, we use uh, Laplace domain transfer functions. So e here I have uh, summarized the S domain representation of a derivative, which is S, an integral, which is 1 by S, and a low pass filter of cutoff frequency n over n plus S. So if we keep a low pass filter in series with the derivative block, then it will give this transfer function which can be used to determine the optimal cutoff frequency. And we can also use block uh, reduction diagram techniques to implement a similar filter using an integrator. So in the end, it's just a trade-off between the cost of the underlying circuit and the computational power of the I and the D blocks. This particular block diagram uh, shows how typical PID controllers are used to design positional altitude and attitude controllers in UAVs. So suppose the drone is flying at uh, a constant level at a correct altitude, but it is a little too far left of where it took off. So this will result in a positional error that feeds into uh, this positional controller the proportional part of the controller will multiply that error by a constant which will request the drone uh, to roll to the right. So the roll controller will see that there is a roll error because the drone is still level and it will request a rolling torque 
which will play through the motor mixing algorithm that I discussed earlier and it will request that the motors on the left side of the drone should speed up and the motors on the right side of the drone should be slowed down. So this will roll the drone to the commanded angle. Now the drone will begin to move to the right but since uh, the vertical component of the thrust is slightly smaller when rolled, the drone will also start to lose altitude. So this will be tracked by our altitude uh, controller and it will increase the thrust command accordingly. So now as the drone continues to move to the right, the position error is dropping and therefore the requested roll angle through the proportional path, which is this path, is also dropping, bringing the drone back at its uh, set point level. And the state estimator and obstacle avoidance blocks will be present somewhere here at the bottom. So they will also feed in uh, the estimates uh, to our PID controllers. Now PID tuning is basically figuring out uh, the optimal values of KP, KD and KI. And I'll briefly try to summarize the different techniques used for PID tuning and how system identification helps test and tweak a controller model before we actually test it on drone's hardware. So once we have a fair idea of how our system will behave in the real world, for example, identify if uh, linearization based analysis tools could be useful or by understanding if our system is open loop stable or by figuring out how fast we want our system to be and uh, by uh, determining what are the main requirements of our system such as figuring out if time domain parameters like rise time and overshoot should be prioritized over the frequency domain parameters like bandwidth we either go for a model based tuning approach or we proceed with the controller design using actual hardware so the following flowchart serves as a rough tuning guide in my case since we are trying to develop a drone model from scratch using a mathematical description of my model that is the uh, equations of flight dynamics that we discussed earlier or using a set of transfer functions state space matrices is often the way to go now an alternative way to develop a model is to use a, a system identification technique so system id uses a measured response from the hardware which is often a step response then it finds an optimal set of model coefficients to match uh, these two responses uh, as close as possible and once we have a model of our system we can use that description to tune the PID controller so for this we can either resort to uh, manual based tuning methods for example we can determine where we want to place the closed loop holes so that the dominant poles are produced uh, by the system stability and the response that we are looking for or we could also use open loop transfer function and things like Nyquist uh, plots to shape uh, the loop function. Or we could just simply go for heuristic uh, based methods such as Ziegler Nichols or Cohen Kuhn method. And in the end, the developer always has a freedom to manually tweak any last minute parameters. And this liberty is one of the most important reasons why PID is more preferred over other controller methods in the case of drones and autonomous systems. So again, PID tuning at a broader level is just about tweaking the value of the gains so as to decide the optimal ones useful for our system. But to understand what actually happens at a lower level, let's try to analyze the system in S domain. So here I've taken the Laplace transform of the uh, uh, PID controller, which gives this particular transfer function. So uh, if we observe this equation, then there's a single pole at the origin in the denominator and the numerator has two zeros uh, whose placement is given by kp ki and the kd and then there's an overall uh, gain term kd uh, so in the end uh, it's just a question of where we should place our two zeros and how much gain uh, to apply and we have to place the two zeros and adjust the gain with our linear model so uh, pole placement and loop shaping are the two uh, uh, commonly used techniques for this purpose. So talking about pole placement, uh, if we know where we want our closed loop poles to be, which ultimately depends on understanding how we want our system to behave. And then if we have figured out the location of the poles that generate that behavior, 
then we can easily devise a controller that places those poles right where we want them. Now I've tried to uh, use Simulink to develop a controller architecture which can then be converted into C code and uploaded on the drone firmware for testing. It is also possible to perform a model based simulation before testing but for now I'll just try to give an overview of the features that the aerospace block set offers for controller development. So it uses a parrot drone model and in the block diagram we can see that uh, the signal editor uh, at the very left is generating the waypoints. PID is implemented in the FCS or the flight control system block. The plant is represented by the airframe uh, and uh, these two uh, sensors and the environment blocks are used to replicate the sensor signals close to real time. Each of these blocks offers us an option to choose between linear and nonlinear models. So this is the state estimator block and two steps are involved here. So first we take the raw sensor measurements and generate estimated states. So first we process the measurements and then we blend them together with filters uh, that we discussed earlier to estimate the control states. Now the details of the sensor processing block uh, reveals this particular subsystem. So here the acceleration and the gyro data are calibrated by subtracting of the bias that had been previously determined and by removing this bias then uh, zero acceleration and zero angular rate should result in a zero measurement. So the next step is to rotate the measurements from the sensor reference frame to the body reference frame and lastly we need to filter the data through a low pass uh, filter to remove the high frequency noise. Similarly if, uh, if say we are using ultrasound to uh, get hold of the distance then it has its own bias uh, removed so in this case uh, this was the default block uh, which was present for the uh, parrot drone model and uh, optical uh, camera flow data uh, also has a similar kind of uh, pass fail criteria so optical flow is again one of the uh, absolute positioning uh, systems that are used in autonomous drones so uh, finally, we conclude uh, our discussion on control theory uh, by studying uh, cascaded loops and discrete systems. So a typical uh, propeller block which uh, we uh, studied earlier while describing the structure of a controller using PID can be further expanded to reveal a smaller uh, feedback loop. So this is the command that goes through the comparator and the resulting error is fed into a PID controller. So the output of the controller is a voltage, which in this case is applied to the actuator causing the motor to spin. So the motor speed is measured by a sensor and it is fed back into the comparator and we have two feedback loops in our system. One that controls the motor speed and one that controls the drone altitude. So these uh, two inner and outer loops are also called cascaded loops or nested loops where the outer loop drives the set point of the inner loop and the inner loop affects the feedback path of the outer loop. Now what are the advantages of such cascaded loops? Well the first is that with a cascaded approach it can be easier to isolate the problems in the system but a more important reason is to run them at different speed to address different problems and sources of error. So uh, in our case the motor controller can very easily respond uh, to the local disturbances whereas the altitude controller can be tuned conservatively to reject the sensor noise and increase stability. So for example in cascaded control suppose the propeller uh, motor takes 10 volts to run 100 rpm which will say is the speed that is required to hover the drone. Now we add some disturbance in our loop maybe the battery voltage drops down uh, or some other type of uh, disturbance. Now uh, the in this case the inner loop uh, motor controller can sense this error and adjust the motor voltage in a fraction of second so that the propeller speed is barely affected. If the inner loop is fast enough then the motor disturbances wouldn't even be seen by the outer loop because there wouldn't be a noticeable change in the altitude. So this would allow for the outer loop to be much slower 
and only respond to relatively slow disturbances like uh, wind gusts and this is the main reason why most of the modern uh, flight controllers uh, which are basically electrical boards with sensors and microcontrollers integrated on it use such a cascaded type of uh, control architecture so this is the uh, architecture of a px4 which is a very popular flight controller and as we can see here the positional controller constitutes the outer loop which runs at a much lower frequency whereas this attitude controller uh, runs at a much higher frequency and it constitutes the inner loop and finally before we conclude our discussion on controllers i want to highlight the importance of discrete type in controllers where time is not treated as a continuous variable so the main reason uh, why they are so useful is that most of the developed pid controllers run on digital uh, processors on board the drones which update at each sample time for example if we have a computer process that is running at 1 hertz then once a second the controller uh, reads the sensors uh, performs some calculation on them and then commands the actuators uh, so the actuators keep that command for the full 1 second duration before receiving a new command at the next sample time so if the sample time is short enough compared to the dynamics of our system then it behaves very similarly to a continuous system this is because the controller can easily read the sensors and update the actuator so fast that it appears practically continuous and the pid control algorithm uh, in case of these uh, discrete time systems uh, often use uh, the z domain representation so basically z transforms are used instead of laplace transform because uh, the z domain ensures that the sample time is fast enough to keep uh, the same behavior such that it can be easily implemented on a digital processor so now i'll uh, quickly try to summarize the hardware architecture of flight controllers so they usually have one onboard processing uh, chip which is usually 32 bit microcontroller unit and it is integrated with all the low level sensors such as uh, the imus uh, and other redundant sensors usually 32 bit processor is capable of implementing all the controller logic like the pids filters state estimator blocks etc and it is also used to uh, send the final commands to the motors and the actuators so uh, in case of autonomous uh, uavs extra sensors such as depth cameras or lidar sensors are often used for absolute positioning and these sensors implement computation expensive algorithms so a companion computer which is often multi core like a raspberry pi uh, is often used in my report i have given a summary of the most common processing chips that are used along with their computing power and i have also tried to benchmark a few imus based on the parameters such as sensitivity or digital zero rate level etc so this will help those who wish to purchase their own imu sensor model glancing at the software architecture we can uh, observe that most of the times a middleware uh, is used like uh, the robot operating system so here is a video of a simulation that i made using ros uh, robot operating system and gazebo software where the drone is equipped with depth and rgb camera used for a pattern based navigation algorithm and image processing is used for object detection basically to detect the obstacles and to detect the landing site now to ensure a real time processing it's important to uh, meet the latency requirements at a software le a system level and ros exactly helps us with the same so if i were to use my navigation and image processing code and the landing code directly on my onboard processor then i would have to specify the individual channel frequencies so that the latency requirements are met ros helps us abstract all this stuff using its publish subscribe architecture so that all these processes take place simultaneously which is often required in autonomous systems and finally i would like to conclude my presentation with a small case study i did on nano quad rotors so a few models like the bit craze crazy fly for instance uh, this is the model are quite popular development platforms however they still require the need of of board sensors and computers for navigation so researchers from eth zurich recently developed a risk 5 based architecture based on the uh, gapit processor 
and they integrated it with a crazy fly model and they were able to execute CNN algorithms on uh, this nano core rotor by executing the workload on different uh, cores. So overall the research areas in this domain are quite large since small UAVs often have sturdy controller requirements and precise integration of microcontroller units with appropriate sensors after mapping the high level algorithm can help distribute the workload for autonomous behavior. So this is also the main focus of our research and we will try to develop such models from scratch now that we have all the background knowledge. So uh, the summary is that this report and presentation are basically meant to serve as a guide for those who are interested in the field of automation and aerial robotics. It compiles all the uh, prerequisite concepts and it explains it from both a uh, mathematical as well as analytical perspective, giving an overall picture of how the components are related right at the lowest systems level. So we hope that it helps provide a direction for further research. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Professor Mayank Goswami and Professor uh, and Mr. Ankur Kumar from the Department of Physics IIT Roorkee for allowing me to work on this project and guiding me throughout this research work. I have uh, compiled all the necessary references and the link to the quotes used for a demonstration can be found in the Google Drive. So this was it from my side. Thank you.